get her talking or do you want her smiling? It's just a photo, so either way. Okay. I'm going in. It's just so bad, but I know. WJCT budget. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, they do have those, uh, you know, yeah. step and repeats. Yeah, they have those. We just did more. Okay. Is there any particular speaker or session? You're getting the feed from them. It's only open to what you want. I think we'll talk about something. Yeah, we'll give me a monitor and I think we can talk a little bit about that too. Sure. Right. Which will be great. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. They last for about an hour. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I, know. I, know. I did it, I do. I actually packed three pairs. Wow. I just wish you the the more yeah, that 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 that. Perfect. Great, now I can, can uh, make it easier for me to switch. One of our genius girl, we have a seven year old genius girl, always a Good Friday. 
Friday morning, live and on the go. Conference. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Melissa Ross. Always live on the radio and now First Coast Connect is also on iTunes. Just ahead, keep listening as we tell you all about Generation W and its incredible impact here on the First Coast. And then later, our Friday media roundtable breaks down the election results around town and we discuss the biggest news of the week much more ahead this hour here from UNS campus. But first, we are live from Generation W at the UNF Fine Arts Center. The premier women's leadership event in Jacksonville, bringing in incredible speakers from around the country, providing incredible information for both men and women. Founder Donna Oranger joins us now to tell us all about it. Donna, a pleasure as always to speak to you. Good morning. Good morning. It's been an incredible morning so far. It's so, it's unbelievable. It's so emotional. Yeah. I know. This is such a positive event. And for people that are part of the generation, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you? Well, it's just like I just said. I, I, you know, and I've said this with passion and with We started Generation W with the belief that when people come together, especially women, magic happens. And uh, we're proven right time and time and time again. It's very, it's very magical. Uh, the people who come here is overwhelming. When I look in the audience, it's the diversity of the representation here from our community, but also from New York, from California, from the Midwest. Um, and the quality of speakers who raise their hands and say, we want to be a part of this. It's just an incredible collaboration. And it's, it's, it's so hard to even single out the particular speakers because you have an incredible lineup today. But can you give us uh, just a few uh, examples of uh, who people will be able to hear? Yeah, we got that. I mean, Elise Nelson, who's the CEO of Vital Voices, is on the stage now telling her story as a 21-year-old kind of going to China. Think about this is 20 years ago. Going to China, trying to get in this women's conference and finding her passion and purpose in life and then truly her work about finding vital voices of women all around the world. It's, in, it's incredibly important work but it's so inspiring. Um, we have the head of Weight Watchers here because you know our relationship with food is a passion point but it's good and it's bad and it's somewhat ugly as well but it's really going to be good to learn about that. We have Deb Walton who's the president of Thompson Reuters of content and she's got an amazing story of women growing up on a sheep farm in Australia now leading actually in the financial world. Right there at the Times uh, River, if we go to Manhattan, see her office is right there. I've been there. Um, we've got a great panel today. We've got issue-oriented stuff today. I mean, John Burr, I know, is here, part of your panel. Um, we're going to talk about gender equality because it is such a huge issue. When we talk about community, we talk about your round table. Really, what we find is is that companies who have diverse leadership, where women are at least 30%, obviously we want 50%, but 50 yes. percent of the population, perform better. There's economic realities. But as much as it liberates women to be in, liberation, in, in, in leadership positions, it's also that much more positive for men as well. I'm really looking forward to John who leads Mark Lamping from the Jaguars, Eric Mann from the Y, Audrey's going to be on that panel, Ed Burr, the head of the Civic Council. I mean, it's going to be pretty great. But yeah, and that's the overriding of uh, generation of uh, providing a platform and a, a, a message so that women feel empowered and men also buy into clearing a path and more women to seek leadership. Well, it's in your own best interest, right? All politics are local, which you guys are going to talk about. So when you want to start with local politics or any issue, you start with the, the personal politics. And if something is better for you personally, then, then you're going to be an advocate. And the truth of the matter is, gender equality is personally good for everyone who is And so I'm really glad to be able to be with such a uh, interesting and intelligent group of people with you. We have Kelly Wells here also from CNN, right. a digital reporter. And we have a, a panel called Generations. We have our anchor at 16 years old, and we have our other anchor at 90 years old. Four generations, well, three generations represented. Actually, we probably can say five. Five. We have the 16-year-old, we have a 20, a college student, 30, 40, 50, and 90. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to play it like the newlywed game. It's called the trend game. What are the trends in the generations of women's lives that you know unite us and the ones that like we might have some like I, I can give you a question if you want. Sure. Um, let's see. Talk, 
text or TV? All three. <laughs> okay, that's fair. I do all three. <laughs> and sometimes simultaneously, which uh, I, I get complaints about. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I mean, this is just an example of that. And of course, WJCT is really a sponsor of Generation W here live at UNF Fine Arts Center. Just a lot happening today. It's very exciting to be part of it. Founder Donald Alderner joining us, and I know you have a very good day. So enjoy, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my pleasure and for all of your listeners, and I know there are a lot of you because I listen every day and I feel part of your community. Please come this afternoon. There, there'll be a couple seats still left, and we'd oh, love okay, to sure. come on down. Yeah, come on out to the UNF Fine Arts Center. Big hands for Donna Orr. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll have more of the future speakers from Generation W on the show later in the hour. But right now, it is Friday, which means on this program, it's time for our media roundtable here today. Nate Monroe of the Florida Times Union. Good morning, Nate. Good morning. So good to see you. WJCT analyst John Burr here today. Eric Smith is here, a people and politics former city councilman. Eric, always a pleasure. Top of the morning to you, Melissa. And A.D. Gekar, City of Folio Weekly and Florida Politics. Good morning. Good morning. Now, guys, Donna just said all politics is local, which is, of course, what we're going to talk about. The results of Tuesday's first election in Jacksonville. Unitary election. There's going to be a runoff in May between incumbent Mayor Alvin Brown and the GOP frontrunner uh, who made it through to the runoff, Lenny Curry. Let's begin with Eric Smith. Eric, uh, what was your reaction to the shakeout on Tuesday night? I'm not sure it is as earth shaking as it's characterized to be. I think uh, some of the intelligentsia has forgotten that there's an appellate process. And they've forgotten the fact that the city council can reconvene tomorrow, the next day, the next week, uh, and reconsider and uh, and do something with that legislation. That said, so you're talking about the pension legislation. Yes, what I'm talking about the, the pension. Okay, legislation. Sure, but but you know what? I wanted to ask you as well uh, about the election results between uh, the mayor and the. Well, I don't think there was any surprise. Uh, if I had a surprise, it was the. Bill Bishop didn't do uh, slightly better, maybe two or three uh, uh, points. And, and, but it turned out about the way uh, that I thought uh, that it would. I don't think there were any huge surprises in the uh, council races. I think it was wonderful that the authorities uh, were included uh, with all of the inspector general and, and, and ethics uh, mandates that will be on, on the city council and other people in government. Nate Monroe, as Eric said, the Bishop uh, had a strong part of really showing us by not having the money and the infrastructure support that was part of the party to do Bill Bishop coming in at about 17% of the race for the mayor. Of course, the big question is now how important is Bill Bishop endorsing the mayor rather than the Bishop is a conservative Republican. He's been on the council floor for eight years, um, and you know a lot of Bishop supporters are Republicans, and they very well could vote for Curry. Curry has made a case that he's making a lot of the same points that Bishop is, but the ages have change. And you know, in reality, I think you can see Curry. You can see John Curry. Bishop will endorse Curry. I mean, he's going to stick with the Republican how current, how uh, Bishop's voters go is a whole different question because I don't think people were uh, necessarily voting Republican Democrat there. I think they were more voting on what on some social issues and the court and the religion issue and things like that where, where Bishop really kind of took some stances that were different than the other candidates. And, and was much more specific in his policy oh, 
And so Alvin Brown and Lenny Curry now, as they move ahead to May, Eric, uh, Alvin Brown with about a five-point lead over Lenny Curry, that gap will close. Uh, how do you see the strategies for both of these candidates over the next eight weeks? Well, well, first I think uh, the mayor has to accept that uh, uh, blood, is, blood is thicker than water, but elephants, Republicans are thicker than that, so it would be a major earthquake if uh, Bishop uh, went uh, with the Brown campaign. But that said, uh, historically, candidates don't deliver uh, all, all their votes. I mean, it, 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 it's not like Moses and Fluff. It's, it's just not going to happen. And I, and I think they might split that vote uh, fairly uh, evenly. But uh, if I, they split that vote evenly, that still gives an advantage to the incumbent mayor. It would. It would. Uh, but, but I think uh, the, the question is uh, whether uh, the mayor's strategists tell him to stay above the fray and stay uh, positive. Uh, the other side has got to have a sense of, of uh, desperation. They've already got a sense of entitlement. <laughs> and, and, and How do you mean? My, my sense is they think they're entitled to have this. Their state party chair as the mayor. And, and, and I, I think it's going to be a very, very question to come with it's dirty on both sides. And if you're just tuning in, first Coast Connect is live today from the UNF Fine Arts Center for the full hour for the Generation W conference. We can't take your calls today, but we want to listen to the something to reach out to the bishop supporters besides the sentimental attachment to the 2011 election. Um, I wanted to take issue with something Eric said regarding the Republicans feeling entitled to the mayorality. So I don't think that's the case. I think Lenny Corey realizes he's in the wild part. Um, he's been working hard for two years to get supporters, get big donors, all of those things. Um, you know, even now he's trying to get a street team together to get out the vote for the election in two months. I don't think they take anything for granted. They know they're up against a serious mayor who's uh, very popular with a lot of national support. W. Washington Schultz, Allison Tamp have both sent messages of support already. So the next two months are going to be Armageddon for Jacksonville politics. And it's going to be wild because we've already had the governor of Texas weigh in. Sure, and that's just the start. <laughs> of course, that's just the start. <laughs> you know, this is the Bishop issue. I mean, uh, it's, it's the it's the narrative of the moment. Both campaigns are going to give lip service to it because you always want to win a new cycle. They'll take a bill bishop in the next one. But whether or not that helps in the long term, I, I don't know. But that's it's not clear to me. And I highly doubt that either campaign is going to change their long term strategy for this. You know, at the end you of the day, I don't think we're going to see any major change out of other candidates. I mean, not not for reasons of like quoting Bill Bishop's reports. At the end of the day, partisans, people that are registered with the party, vote with their party 95% of the time. That's just the way it works. That's how the poll. That's how the pollsters look at it. That's how the consultants look at it. They're going to be interested in boosting turnout and ramping up their base and getting as high as they can get. It. That's the game. John Burr, uh, do you agree or disagree? Well, I, I, I think there's a big wild work. I think that it was a turnout. Turnout was held oh, roughly, what, 32, 33 percent, I believe. Um, that means, you know, whatever, 67 percent of the eligible voters didn't vote. Well, something, something to find a way to turn on some of those voters. Just two or three or four percent of them. In 2011, we saw higher turnout in the runoff, Eric, than we did in the in the March uh, first election. Can we? Can Jacksonville repeat that? 
Well, the, the, nothing is impossible. But uh, unless uh, one or both of these uh, candidates uh, uh, becomes way more inspirational, I think uh, the turnout stays uh, the way it is. Or, in, 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 or unless some uh, event we can't predict uh, happens in the next uh, several weeks, that, that could certainly turn an election. But, uh, and the last, the last election was only decided by 1,600 votes, and that's, that's, that's razor thin. And uh, so, uh, I, I sure hope these people vote. What, what is more important than that? Yeah, that's a Supporters, you know, even screen over supporters of the average. And I think Jefferson's got the worst thing to get. So, and also Williams has a unified message of money for us. And that is to say, the job the same thing, it's getting cops back on the street, it's taxable journey programs, etc. Um, you know, Jefferson's message doesn't necessarily apply to Brown. Uh, Jefferson talked about lost generation, the pulls of water street, uh, regarding gang and shooting, violence versus fire. You're not going to get that from Robert Brown. Robert Brown is messing with causing Robert Brown. So, we're going to have to get a five of the messages. We have a lot of people. ID helps. Name ID helps big time. Yeah, and, and John, uh, what you just said about Mayor Brown and Kim Jefferson, do they need to coordinate their messaging in the same way that Bill Clinton and Mike Williams will be coordinating theirs? Well, that you know, obviously that would help somewhat. But you know, I think with the sheriff's race, I think it's less partisan even than the mayor's race. I think people vote for him, and the, both candidates have a really good opportunity to define themselves. Both sheriffs can be Sure. And I think, you know, whichever one defines themselves and what they want to do best, they will win that race. And let's talk about, just for a minute, the racial politics of this, Eric Smith. Let's assume that uh, Mayor Brown and Ken Jefferson are both victorious. That would be a, an historic racial breakthrough for the city of Jacksonville, the first time in history we would have an African American mayor and sheriff at the same time. You know, I'm not sure it would be a historic breakthrough. I, I think it would be interesting and, and important, but uh, I don't think any of the candidates is really talking uh, about that or, or stressing that point. But back to the uh, messaging, uh, I think it's awfully difficult for uh, the mayor and Ken Jefferson to coordinate messages, and it's probably got more downside than it's got upside. Clearly, uh, Williams is the running mate to Lenny Kirk. There's no question about that. Uh, an interesting uh, dynamic will be whether the sheriff continues to go on television in full battle regalia using the badge, which I think is wrong, uh, to uh, promote uh, the candidacy. It, uh, there's a lot of concern about uh, the mayor using the, uh, the, the seal of the city. That's not nearly as significant as bad. But it's going to be interesting to watch this. I think it'll be very close. Uh, it, definitely so. And also we can realize this week as we talk about the JSO and that pension uh, and also that firefighters, that much can be a pension or a and all the people who failed the city council Tuesday. They 
Step up to 9 tonight on a vote to amend pensions to pay down the city's huge unfunded liability. Uh, this was a blow to Mayor Brown's administration. His chief of staff, who uh, uh, they uh, those that voted against the city and they had legitimate concerns about how this was going to be done. Right. We have two Democrats voting against it, um, Presham Denny and Denise Lee. Um, so it wasn't strictly a party line thing. There were Republicans voting for it, Jim Love, Greg Anderson, people like that. Um, so it wasn't as cut and dry as it seems. Um, regarding the politics of it, um, it was interesting that Bill Bishop was notable in his um, opposition to the pension. He was one of the key people on, on council to say, um, I can't support this deal. We're passing on the problem to future generations. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see if the mayor can get any movement on it. Um, there have to be significant or substantial changes for it to be reintroduced to council within the next year. Um, so the deal's got to be altered in some way. And right now the deal's a non-starter. They don't have the financing deal, the financing part of it worked out. And, you know, given the politics of it, given the mechanics of it, I'm pessimistic they can get something done before the election. Um, well, to AG's point, because of the new development, I expect we'll be discussing her shortly. I think the entire pension is still more than she is. Let's talk about that uh, because the circuit court just ruled uh, just a, a minute ago uh, that uh, actually it was yesterday uh, an existing 30 year agreement between the city and the Jacksonville Police Department is invalid because it was negotiated. Yeah, and that, I mean, everyone is kind of scrambling to sort of make sense of how to go forward from here. In a way, you know, so it's going to be, this, this ruling will be appealed, uh, so we're going to be in some legal limbo for a while, but if this is upheld, it's on its face a pretty good ruling for the city, it would achieve, um, it, you know, it would break the city from this long-term commitment to, you know, return the benefits for these firefighters. Um, you know, it could ultimately be a good thing, but we'll have to just see how all this stuff works out. Yeah, and it's hard to predict John Burr, uh, how, if, whether that ruling will stand and, and implications of that. Well, I think we can predict the uh, union will be uh, beyond that, you're right. Uh, although, you know, it's a second ruling on this uh, freedom of information question. Yeah. Let's go on the same way. So, uh, you know, let's say, let's say the, uh, the ruling is that you can upheld to the situation that it's going to. You know, the city, um, yeah, the city's in a little better position, but on the other hand, you know, the, they don't want to alienate the police and fire. You know, uh, you know, the fire department, the people the fire department, it's tough for them to improve because of this kind of uh, thing. And, you know, so it's a very delicate, uh, long range, delicate uh, situation. Eric Smith, what are your thoughts? Well, it's interesting to talk about the 30 year agreement because I think it's down to a 14 year agreement now, right? Yeah, 15 years of it. Don't hesitate to strike me down if I'm wrong, but now it's a 14 year agreement. And I, I, I think a few months down the road, regardless of the ruling, uh, something will get done, but it won't get done now because it's part of a political strategy. Don't let the mayor look like a leader. It's better that he looked like he tried, he failed, he tried, he failed. Uh, and, uh, I think that's, that's, that's the politics. I, I disagree with this. I mean, I, you keep bringing up that it makes the mayor look like a leader or doesn't make the mayor look like a leader, but you know, the deal is the leadership would be getting the deal through. I don't think that the Republicans are obstructing it just for the sake of obstructing it. I think they have serious problems with the deal. Um, I listened to it for four hours the other night. Um, they went point by point, reiterated their issues with the deal. So, you know, while it looks political on the surface, while there's a political element to it, maybe there's some issue with the deal also that, you know, Yarbrough, Bishop, all these people have material points against it. I'm not going to debate the, whether or not it's political. An important point to keep in mind here is that reforming the benefits, that is one piece of this. It's a good piece, but it's not, it's not the determinant. Figuring out how to more quickly pay down the city's 
you know, one point six billion dollar debt for a fifty five pension plan. Nothing takes effect until that's figured out. That has never even been close to being resolved. The council and the mayor are still totally sideways on how that gets done. Even if minus the school ruling on Wednesday night, the council would approve this deal. It doesn't take effect until that funding mechanism is figured out. I, I think Nate is absolutely on point. And, 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 and I'm not really cross purposes with, with AG because there are many honorable people at the council and in both parties that just had problems with it. If I was on the council, I would have some serious reservations about making this deal with the JEA. There's too many unanswered, open-ended uh, questions. So I'd be asking those kind of questions. John. Well, I think, you know, the, the whole question of uh, the mayor is just going to be completely thrown up in the air. I, uh, I think, actually, the, the, uh, the judge's ruling yesterday kind of takes the heat off the of mayor uh, for not finding, quote, not finding an agreement. Because uh, everybody's, you know, just like, geez, where do we go now? Where do we go now? That, that becomes the issue. And the issue is not, gee, the mayor. Thanks to this judge, judge ruling, the issue is not good Lord, where do we go now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And where we go now is our finally uh, weekly roundup of the strange, bizarre, just plain ridiculous rain prostitution tables. Luckily, there's never a shortage of material in your history right now. Only in Florida, critters, bath salts, and third graders who will not flunk out make the cut today. Because only in Florida do a couple of drunk guys go joyriding with a wounded owl and capture it all on film as well. But state wildlife officials aren't laughing. According to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, two men to face charges for keeping a great horned owl captive. They uploaded the video to Facebook a couple weeks ago. It shows them driving around with the owl, which appeared to be dazed or stunned. The man who claims to have shot the video wrote on his Facebook page that they found the owl while driving around West Palm Beach and wanted to try it out. Of <laughs> Only in Florida do men high on bath salts head but the windshields of terrified female drivers. Volusia County deputies say 35-year-old Richard Cooper dented the hood of a woman's Kia with his head and cracked open the windshield too while high on the bath salts. The driver stopped the vehicle and started screaming. On, uh, his name? Kiefer was arrested. If it's Florida, it's bath salts. That doesn't speak well to the key of integrity. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, only in Florida can you flunk out and still get promoted to the next grade. Actually, that happens in other states, too. But amid continued backlash over Florida's testing regimen in schools, the state may stop that, may stop holding back third graders who failed this week on a standardized test. If lawmakers agree to the change, it would mark a big departure from a policy pushed into law by former Governor Jeb Bush, who vowed to end social promotion as part of his A-plus education law, tying the promotion to fourth grade, while students did a standardized reading test. So if you have a third grader out there who flunks this week, well, it looks like they might not be Well, they'll figure out reading soon. That would have been good news for me in third grade, I'll tell you that. <laughs> No child, left behind. <laughs> no child left behind in, in another way. Thanks, Eric Smith, Nate Monroe, A.G. Dan Kersky, and John Burr. Thanks for coming out for our live event. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And still to come, much more from the UNF Fine Arts Center. We are broadcasting live from the Generation W Women's Leadership Conference. Keep listening. We'll be right back. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know what's up next. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. <laughs> what is up next? <laughs> I'm going to try to record it, but I think my battery's going to die. Or Not yet. I don't know if there's any Nice to meet you. Casey.
Why am I in my ears? <laughs> Dr. Christos Lampropoulos, Assistant Professor of Chemistry here at UNF, and you're hosting the event? Yes, I, I got the brand. <laughs> Ten seconds. <laughs> and welcome back to First Coast Connect, broadcasting live from the UNF Fine Arts Center from today's Federation W Conference. We're live and on the go this morning on this there is always so much happening at the University of North Florida. Incredible research always going on. And we want to share some of it with you right now. Dr. Casey Nicolau, the Harry C. and Olga King Weiss Professor of Chemistry at Rice University, will speak tonight here at the end. His research group first synthesized the widely used anti cancer drug and a number of other drugs for treatment of cancer. Professor of Chemistry, Jennifer Martin. Good morning. 